we need to get into the topic understanding the Islamic context. But before going into that lecture, let's uh, look at uh, the practical aspect of understanding our friends. Here is a man, Robert D. Nobili. Robert D. Nobili made a great contribution to missiology, particularly in this uh, 14th and 15th century, people like him try to understood, understand the culture and the context. You know, now today in this 21st century, we are really struggling now. But this man, way back in 14th century, he implemented and he saw an amazing success in his ministry. Uh, and uh, the world appreciated him. Even now, people start looking at him. There is a controversy in that, but uh, let's uh, look at him. Coming from a noble family, well-to-do family, he gave his uh, commitment to join in uh, mission service. When his father died, so he got into this mission service uh, in Catholic, Catholic Church. So Robert Dini Nobili was, uh, put, uh, in one sense, uh, he was adamant, you know, in, in the language that we say adamant, but in a sense that he is very strong in his conviction. Once he is convicted, and he, he will never leave it. So he was so strong in his conviction that he wants to follow in the mission steps. So when God calls, no human consideration should stop us. That's what, that, that was his slogan. When his family objected, his mother and others, he said, no, when God is calling, I need to go. That's in 1596. Ignoring his family's uh, wishes, he entered the Jesuit mission, particularly Jesuit, Jesuit mission, with the invention of becoming, intention of becoming a foreign missionary. And he committed himself, and then in the early error, he wanted to go to Japan, but he, the finally, early in 1606, Robert was sent to the fishery coast to live among the Parawas a large fishery community at uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. Particularly, this uh, Parava community has turned to Christ by the investment of Francis Xavier. Prior to him, a Catholic missionary, Francis Xavier, Maybe you can, uh, uh, when we do history of Christianity in India, we study about him. Francis Xavier also used a contextualized methodology. A tall man, an European, landed in that rugged, muddy land of uh, Parava uh, environment where there is a lot of smell, dust, hurts. No, he lived in a small hurt, Francis Xavier, and uh, he became like, uh, like them and then he used to take a bell in his hand, goes around the village and uh, singing songs and attracted children. And he did an amazing ministry. Since already there was a little ministry ar arrangement, so he was sent to that Parava community. But he was not happy there because Christianity has been understood as a low profile religion during that time because Paravas came to Christ. So when he landed into that environment, he studied the culture and then he understood if I need to reach people of India, I need to take a different methodology. And then he introduced himself as the teacher of wisdom, not like a traditional pastor or a father, but the teacher of wisdom. After a short stay in Cochin, in Kerala, he took up residence in Madurai in November 1606. And then he came, he soon called himself a teacher of wisdom, began to dress like a sannyasin. He did not enter into the footsteps of 
Francis Xavier because Xavier worked like a Christian. He understood the context of India. So he thought I need to be relevant to the people and the culture of India. So he himself introduced as a sannyasin. And he adopted that Indian sannyasin dress and the lifestyle. Or wooden, he wore wooden cloaks, you know, like a gurus used to wear in those days, wooden cloaks, and a saffron robe. He abstained from eating meat, no meat eating, climbing noble parentage, he approached flower caste people and uh, eagerly engaged in dialogue with the friends and the scholars about the truths of Christianity. And it was his investigation. Nobody taught him when he landed in this country, he tried to understand how best I can help the people of this India. As a European tall man, white man, he used to tell the people that I am uh, the forward caste community from uh, the European land because he is so tall, wider than the Brahmins, and his structure, physique, his language really help people to listen to him. And um, he he is a master. He mastered in Indian languages. He mastered Sanskrit, Telugu, and Tamil. By the way, languages and literature with the help of his teacher Shiva Dharma. As he expounded the Christian doctrine in Tamil, he coined several words to communicate his message. He, used, he was relevant to the culture and the context of the time. He used the word Kovil for a place of worship. He didn't use the traditional word church, Kovil. Uh, I don't know exactly what does it mean, Brother Francis, Kovil, in a way that we can understand. Kovil means temple in Tamil. Oh, yeah, in temple. Oh, yeah, temple. Arul and uh, Prasadam for grace. And Guru for priest or teacher. Vedam for the Bible. Pusai for mass for the service. So he tried to contextualize even the words. He contextualized his dress. He contextualized his words and he was so relevant to the culture and the con uh, to that people and local Indian. He shaved his head and uh, keeping only a tiny tuft. Another could be the and uh, he himself introduced I'm I, I am Brahmin from Europe and then uh, he uh, hired a cook, uh, wore a white dhoti and uh, wooden sandals uh, to don the look of a sannyasin. He was wearing of a three stretched uh, thread across the chest, you know, this um, uh, the sacred thread. So there are a lot of implications left to discuss. So I'm not proposing we should use it, but that's the practice he did. He interpreted the three stringed thread as representing the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he, the outer look, he tried to give an impression to the people that he is one with them. He was one of the first European to understand the culture of India and particularly learn Sanskrit and Tamil. He learned 32 languages in his lifestyle. And some scholar says he is the father of missions in India. Maybe William Carey is known as father of modern missions in India, but uh, uh, he is the father of missions in India because he he had such a great uh, courage and confidence to develop a new methodology. He composed a catechisms, apologetic work, and philosophical discourses in Tamil, and contributed greatly to the development of modern Tamil prose writing, a great apologist in his times. 
and what not there is a lot of achievement and uh, Ro Ro robert de nobles first hindu follower of christ was a shudra school master by the end of uh, 1606 even uh, the um, the panchamas are below the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes are below the shudra and the, above the shudra Vaishya and um, the Kshatriya, and above them, the, 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 uh, in that hierarchy, Shudra schoolmaster came to Christ first. By the end of 1608, just two years after arriving Madurai, De Nobly had baptized at least 10 young men of caste. As his circle of disciples expanded, he became friends with a Brahmin Sanskrit scholar named Sivadharma who after consider, considerable hesitation, permitted De Nobly to see and study the Vedas and the Upanishads. You know, in that particular time, 14th century, De Nobly studied Vedas and uh, Upanishads. As a result, as a result of his friendly environment with the society, De Nobly is uh, brought to be the first, thought to be the first European to study Sanskrit and even to see the Hindu sacred writings. At the beginning of their relationship, Shiva Dharma may have believed that he was converting the personal European to Hinduism. Look at here. No, it's a kind of uh, reverse order. He was thinking that he was converting a European to Hindu order. But by 1609, Robert Robert de Nobly had persuaded Shiva Dharma to read the Bible, which de Nobly referred to as the Christian Veda and to accept Christian baptism. Story didn't end there. By the end of 1609, Robert de Nobly had gathered around him some 60 new followers of Christ, including a few Brahmins. The new followers of Christ were not asked to violate the rules of caste are to give up any custom which was not indisputably idolatrous. The signs of caste such as the threat and the kudimi were given a Christian blessing. But here, I, I, even I have a problem here, uh, the new followers continuing in the caste, because of that, re, nobly, the de nobly had to be uh, appeared before the Pope and uh, there were a lot of allegations on him for uh, introducing some unethical, unbiblical uh, praxis into the mission uh, and then he had to give his uh, rational in front of the Pope. So that was the method he approached, having a kind of style uh, and then in his last days died at Mylapur, India in January 1636, during his final years, he was banished to Jaffna, where by then he had lost much of his eyesight and eventually moved to Madras as he was not allowed back to Madurai by the Jesuits because of his mission methodology. Thus it was in Mylapur that the Farmer Count of uh, Sivitala died after his last eight painful years in the year 1636, a broken, penniless, and blind man. At the end, he was not having broken, penniless, and blind man. So, even now many people talk about it, but uh, Catholic Church uh, later on used this deed nobilis accommodation and inculturation model. His uh, model is called as accommodation, accommodating the, the Hindu culture into the church. And inculturation, when we do this um, uh, particular study, we understand that what are the terms, what is inculturation, what is accommodation, we do an in-depth study, but now, so accommodation and inculturation uh, goes beyond contextualization. So we are not proposing that, particularly I'm not getting into that. So I'm talking about critical contextualization where we come back to the Bible and critically evaluate the culture. Whatever is uh, uh, not biblical, we may be transforming such cultural issues.
Let me take uh, two minutes uh, to discuss on this, then we can go to the actual lesson prepared for today. Any questions on this?